Thank you. It's, the lights are bright. Um, I'm James Sirwicki. I'm the New Yorker's business columnist, and I'd like to welcome you here to, the, I guess, one of the last events of the uh, of the festival. I hope you've all uh, enjoyed yourselves. If you've if you've gone to other ones, I've heard it's actually been uh, been terrific. So, just a couple things I need to remind you of. Uh, if you can silence your phones, please. And uh, this is new. Uh, at least we didn't say this last year. But if you are going to tweet about this, um, the hashtag we're using is. TNY Fest. So I am going to uh, speak for, I don't know, however long I speak for, and then uh, take questions. And when we do that, uh, I believe there are going to be mics in the audience. Uh, so if you do have questions, if you can wait till the mic either gets to you or they may put them up uh, in the aisles uh, because we are recording this, so we want to be able to, uh, to hear your questions. So with that, um, let's get going. So. A few weeks ago, Hewlett Packard fired its CEO, a man named uh, Leo Apotheker. Apotheker had been hired by Hewlett Packard approximately 11 months earlier in a somewhat rushed succession decision that was made after Hewlett Packard had fired its previous CEO, Mark Hurd, in the wake of a uh, somewhat salacious uh, potential scandal. Apotheker had been hired very quickly. And in fact, the vast majority of Hewlett Packard's board members had never even met him before they hired him. Nonetheless, uh, when they hired him, they paid $3 million to relocate him from Germany, where he had been living as uh, he had been formerly CEO of, of SAP, to California. And they had actually paid for the losses he suffered when he had to sell his house. Unfortunately, despite the fact that Hewlett Packard had invested quite a bit of money in hiring Apotheker, he did a uh, remarkably poor job as CEO of the company, which is why he was fired after only 11 months. Uh, the company's stock dropped approximately um, nearly 50 percent during his tenure. Uh, he made a series of strategic decisions that uh, seemed mysterious at best to most outside observers. And uh, at the moment, Hewlett Packard is really seen as a company that had gone from one of the most important companies in Silicon Valley to uh, a company in profound disarray. Nonetheless, uh, Mr. Apotheker was wonderfully rewarded for his uh, great tenure at Hewlett Packard. In fact, he received a $13.2 million payout. He got $7.2 million in cash. He was able to sell, they allowed him to sell almost $4 million in restricted stock, and he got a $2.4 million bonus. Uh, now, this was actually not new for Hewlett Packard. Uh, in 2007, as many of you probably remember, Carly Fiorina was fired uh, after a, a somewhat tumultuous tenure as CEO there. Uh, she walked away with more than $21 million in cash and stock. And her successor, Mark Hurd, and Hurd at least did actually do a, a very good job at Hewlett Packard, but even though he was fired for essentially having an improper relationship with uh, a, a contractor, he actually received severance of more than $12 million. So you can understand why some people now say that Hewlett Packard has the worst board of directors in the history of American capitalism. And as, as, I, as I looked at the Apotheker story, obviously it's, it's yet another in uh, what I think for most people is a long series of infuriating uh, events in, in corporate America over the last decade or so. But it struck me that it was about more than just an incompetent board. Instead, what I think it really was was the manifestation of what to me I, has come to seem like perhaps the most fundamental and pervasive problem uh, that we face in the U.S. economy. And in fact, in a way, it's, it's one of the, the most pervasive predicaments in modern life. Uh, when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about here uh, a few weeks ago, I was sort of going back and looking at the stories I'd written over the last decade. I've been at The New Yorker for about 11 years. And as I was looking at, at all the pieces I'd written, or too many, really, uh, but as I was looking at them, what I was really struck by was that there was this kind of, what seemed to me like a common thread running through many of those pieces. And it was one that, to me, was the, the Apotheker debacle kind of exemplified. And the problem, I think, that it exemplifies is something that economists call the principal agent problem. So that's principal, P-A-L, agent problem. This is a problem that, to my mind, played a major role 
in fueling the housing bubble and the financial crisis of this decade. It was the basis for the Wall Street scandals of the late 1990s. It was the heart of the problem at companies like Enron and WorldCom. And it's a problem that shapes, I think, our daily lives. Uh, it shapes our relationships with everyone from mechanics to real estate brokers to lawyers to doctors. And it's a problem that uh, we are often actually on, on two sides of, uh, that sometimes we're principals and sometimes we're agents. Now, the, a principal-agent relationship arises uh, whenever one person, so we'll call that person the principal, delegates authority to another person, the agent, uh, to act in his or her interests. Okay. Now, you can extend this to, to a wide range of, of occupations, but let's talk about some of the more uh, obvious examples of it. So shareholders, if you buy stock in a company, rather than try to run the company yourself or in conjunction with your other shareholders, you hire a CEO to basically do it and, and presumably to act in your uh, best interests. Uh, CEOs, in turn, uh, hire or pay a, a whole series of people to do work uh, for them and, and to act, again, in the best interests of the corporation. Uh, you hire lawyers to represent you in court. Uh, you hire stockbrokers to manage your investments. And you hire doctors to look after your health. You hire mechanics to fix your car. Uh, and these relationships, while obviously that we've always had them in, in the economy, they play an especially large role in, in our economy today because knowledge is more specialized than, than ever before. And so deferring to the judgment of, of experts or professionals seems to make more sense than ever before. Now, this process often works, works fine. Um, if you hire someone to paint your house, it usually gets painted reasonably well. Uh, I just did that, and I was pretty happy with the results. Uh, if you sort of hire someone to build a television set for, for you, you don't actually do that, obviously, but you buy a television set that someone else has built. Um, nowadays, that works exceptionally well. But in many other principal-agent relationships, it does not work as well as we hope. And that's especially true when we have uh, relationships in which one person knows a lot more about what's happening than the other person does. Uh, so that would be the case in, let's say, with medicine or with law or in many cases with corporate America. Uh, the agent, the person who's doing the actual work, has, has much greater knowledge of what, of what actually needs to be done and, and of what they are doing to help you or not help you uh, than, than you do. This is what economists call an information asymmetry. And it can lead to what is sometimes termed opportunistic behavior. That's a kind of generous reference. The less generous reference is cheating, basically. Uh, and, and this can lead to problems both uh, big and small. And it, and it does this because we really are, I think most of us, are putting more and more responsibility for our lives in the hands of other people. And, and in order for this to work well, you really have to make sure that the incentives people have, the agents have, uh, are designed pretty carefully. Because if you don't, uh, you're often going to end up with, with a situation in which consciously or unconsciously, and that's part of what makes it so tricky, the agents are going to put their interests first. So there are a lot of examples of this. We'll just talk about a few, and then I'll get to more concrete uh, stories. But so, you know, this works on a high level. Shareholders worry about whether the CEO is going to do a good job or whether or not they're, the directors they hire to represent them are going to do a, a reasonable job of hiring CEOs. But um, executives have to worry about it with workers, right? I mean, every worker kind of wants to get paid well, but also wants to be able to slack off when they, you know, don't feel like working. And so it's, it's hard to figure out if you're a manager, how do you optimize the level of work uh, that the worker is doing? Um, what's the way to kind of balance worker freedom against, you know, kind of figuring out whether or not they're actually doing the job they're supposed to be doing? There's a great, and that, this, this has gotten harder as work has become, the, the output of workers has become harder to measure. With an assembly line, you can kind of have a sense of how much people are doing or not doing, but with kind of knowledge work, it's trickier. Uh, there's a great old cartoon that kind of captures this perfectly. The two managers of the Acme Soap Company walk by uh, the open door of an office. And in it, you see a guy with his legs up on, on the desk. Uh, and is, he's just kind of staring out the window. And one of the managers says to the other, that's Jones. He's one of our best thinkers. And the second manager says, yes, but how do we know that he's thinking about soap? So, uh, and, 
in a, in a very mundane way, we all kind of have concrete experience with this. The, the sort of classic example of it is, is, is the auto mechanic. Um, many of you probably remember the Seinfeld episode in which uh, Jerry is trying to figure out whether a mechanic is kind of screwing him over uh, with, his, with, with the prices he's offering. And, and George Costanza says, of course he's trying to screw you over. He says, no one knows what mechanics are talking about. You know, you go there and, and they say, oh, it seems like you need a new Johnson rod. And you're like, yeah, sure, a Johnson rod. Get me one of those, basically. And so this is kind of a persistent problem. And this is not, as I said, a new problem. So, in fact, one of the great examples of it goes back to the, to the 19th century. Uh, in, in the rise of the railroads. So the, the, one of the most powerful railroad companies in American history was the Central Pacific Railroad. They actually helped build the Transcontinental Railroad. They were the ones who, who built uh, part of it that ended up in the, you know, the Golden Spike, essentially. The Central Pacific Railroad was started by four Sacramento merchants. They were called the Big Four. And one of them was Leland Stanford, who ended up founding uh, Stanford University. So they had the right to build the western end of the Transcontinental Railroad. They built it from California uh, west, uh, east and then met in Colorado. Now, the Central Pacific was, had, uh, had the blessing of enormous land grants that it had gotten from the various states and the federal government. It received uh, enormous taxpayer subsidies, and it actually had a monopoly on rail traffic into California. So outside investors when they saw all this said you know this is going to be a tremendous investment we're going to make enormous amounts of money and so they put a tremendous amount of money into the company's stocks and bonds many of these investors were actually foreign they were uh, many of them were british investors unfortunately most of the profits in fact very few of the profits ever reached england instead they found their way to the pockets of the big four because what the Big Four had done was they started a company called the Central Pacific Railroad in which people could invest. But they also started a, an outside construction firm. And this construction firm just happened to win the contract to build the railroad. And not surprisingly, that construction company vastly overcharged for its services. So that by the, essentially what the, the Big Four did was by the time the actual Transcontinental Railroad had been built, they had essentially taken in $50 million, which back then was, was real money, uh, in overcharges alone. In effect, they kind of funneled all of the investors' money out of the Central Pacific Railroad and into, into their external construction company. And when investors came, investigators came calling to find out what had actually happened, they discovered that the construction company's records, ha uh, con records had been, not surprisingly, destroyed. Uh, now, this actually did not... Um, deter other investors, though. British uh, investors continued to put enormous amounts of money into American railroads in the hope that they would reap the great benefits of the, of the booming American economy. Uh, but things did not get any better. One of my favorite letters is a letter that was written by a, a British, an emissary of British investors who had been sent to America in the 1890s to find out what had happened to their money, basically. And he wrote back a note saying, um, even one of our own directors in New York, so, so he was talking to one of the boards of, members of the board of directors, when asked to give us some information as to what had become of the English capital sent out, said, he told me, well, really, sir, that is what I am always asking, but which I can never get to know. And he said, it has been most demoralizing. Uh, and the phrase, other people's money, which I, which I sort of allude to in my title of, of this talk, actually comes from a book by Louis Brandeis. Uh, which was written in 1914, in which Brandeis invade against the domination of the economy by bankers, in language that actually sound very familiar to, to people today. So Brandeis was really worried most about monopoly, about the, the power of Wall Street over, over the economy as a whole. But one of the things that he was most offended by was that investment bankers were getting so rich off of other people's money. As he put it, the goose that lays golden eggs has been considered a most valuable possession. But even more profitable is, taking, is the privilege of taking the golden eggs laid by someone else's goose. And that really is the situation that, that I think is at the core of the problem, is the, the ease with which people are able to make money uh, by taking the golden eggs laid by someone else's goose. Now, uh, this, is, so this has been a perennial problem, but at the beginning of the, cent of the 20th century, it was less of an issue. A third of the company's cor biggest corporations were family-owned. In other words, the person that was running the company also owned it, so in some ways they were kind of controlling what, what was actually happening. 
But the rise of the modern corporation created a kind of new situation. So what you had was a set of professional managers, professional executives. You know, they would essentially run the company, and the people that provided the money uh, were basically absentee shareholders. They had very little influence over what actually happened. Uh, they were dispersed, uh, generally were not concentrated. Uh, regulations actually made it hard for them to exercise much influence. Now this, in some ways, was, was a good thing. There were good things about this. Uh, it allowed for uh, professional managers to become quite expert in their jobs. Um, it allowed people to rise in a kind of somewhat meritocratic fashion instead of nepotism and the like. But it also created problems. Um, the most uh, common of those was that executives, instead of trying to run companies uh, in the interests of shareholders instead tended to run them kind of to build empires. So they were more interested in building big companies uh, rather than profitable companies. Uh, they tended to create, this is why in the 60s and 70s, executives tended to have massive expense accounts. They often had incredibly luxurious offices uh, because all of these things were ways for them to kind of feather their own nests uh, without actually um, running into problems, running into problems with shareholders. The great expression of this, of the, of the kind of uh, backlash against this, actually came in the movie Wall Street. I don't know how many of you remember the, movie, uh, the film, but in the film there's this great scene where Gordon Gecko basically appears at a shareholder meeting and essentially kind of uh, takes the mic and basically um, the scene is uh, all the executives of the company, Teldar Paper, are sitting on this, on this dais and there's a ton of them basically. And Gecko says, in the days of the free market, when this country was a top industrial power, there was accountability to the stockholder. The Carnegies, the Mellons, the men that built this great industrial power made sure of it because it was their money at stake. Today, management has no stake in the company. And then he looks up and he says, all together, the men sitting here own less than 3% of the company. He said, and who pays for this? He said, you, the stockholder. And you are all being royally screwed over by these bureaucrats with their luncheons, their hunting and fishing trips, their corporate jets, and golden parachutes. And that's, in turn, when he goes on to say, basically, greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. For him, greed was a way of pushing those guys out of the way and letting stockholders uh, run the company, which worked less well than we had kind of hoped it would, basically. But so although this problem has been with us all along, I think it is now both more common and more important. The world is, to begin with, more complex. Uh, and while the internet has certainly made it easier, as I'll talk about, for people to become informed and to attain a more knowledge about what's actually happening, professionalization and specialization has also increased the complexity of the world we live in. And so we have Wall Street firms where even the CEOs don't actually understand the financial products their firms are dealing in. Uh, you have uh, law where it is very hard for, for a lay person or an amateur to have any real sense of what's going on in the courtroom. And obviously medicine is an enormously complex uh, world as well. The world is obviously also more uh, globalized. It's bigger in the sense of in a smaller communities it's easier to monitor people. And it's easier to build personal relationships uh, where trust actually plays a role and, and helps shape the decisions people make. Uh, today the world is obviously more impersonal. That's good, I actually think, in, in certain ways, but it also makes monitoring uh, the people that are trying to represent your interests um, harder than it once was. And the result is that we have an explosion in principal-agent conflicts. So you can see this in a wide variety of, of areas. Uh, in real estate, for instance, I'm not even going to talk about the housing bubble in a minute, but even before the housing bubble, there's a fascinating study that was done in 2002 by Steve Levitt, the, one of the co-authors of, of Freakonomics. What he did was he looked at real estate agents and he compared how long the houses of real estate agents stayed on the market compared with the houses of their clients. And what he found was that the houses of real estate agents stayed on the market significantly longer and actually ended up selling for significantly higher prices than the houses of their clients. Seems a bit mysterious, and the question was why? And, and what it was, was Levitt, as he sort of deduced, was it was a question of incentives. So for a real estate agent, you know, a real estate agent gets a commission on uh, you know, the, house they, the houses they sell. But it, the commission is a relatively small percentage of the, of the asking price. 
So for a real estate agent, with their clients, the incentive is actually to try to move as much product as possible. Because the benefit of it staying on the market for another month or another two months, even if it gets the client another $20,000, is relatively small. Uh, relative to the amount of work they have to do if they have to show the, the property again and, and again and again. So the idea is that essentially they were encouraging people to actually try to move their properties. Uh, but with their own homes, they essentially would keep all of the added profit. And so they had an incentive to actually let the, the house stay on the market longer and uh, get a better selling price. And so here, the principal-agent conflict really worked against the principal. The agent actually ended up uh, uh, serving their own interests rather than the interests of the person they were representing. In medicine, um, we now know that the fee-for-service system in which people basically pay for uh, you know, particular operations or whatever, rather than a more holistic model of medical care, um, probably encourages doctors to over-treat. Not all doctors and not in every situation, but uh, myriad studies have shown that when doctors have uh, financial stakes, uh, either in uh, the, the kinds of operations they're doing um, or if they get paid more based on how many operations they do, they tend to do more operations than they otherwise would. Now, doctors themselves insist that how they get paid doesn't make a difference in the uh, kinds of treatments they prescribe. And I actually think in the vast majority of cases, that's, they absolutely believe that. And it may, in many cases, it doesn't seem to make a difference. But uh, if you look across the board, it's very clear that if you increase the financial rewards for certain kinds of treatments, you also increase the number of those treatments. In effect, supply creates its own demand. Now, you also see this on a more, uh, in other areas. So auto dealers, okay, so auto dealers are no one's favorite people. Uh, but um, but uh, even if they're not shady in the kind of traditional sense, it is very clear that, again, how they get paid has a big effect on the kinds of services they offer to customers. So as you may or may not know, auto dealers actually routinely get incentive payments from lenders for steering customers toward particular lenders. And they also are able to use, sometimes able to use the financing process to tack on additional fees. Um, they also are able to sometimes mark up loans to a higher rate and then pocket the difference. And a study that was done a couple years ago by Raj Date and Brian Reed found that these things, these various kinds of tricks they can pull, basically add up to more than $20 billion a year in added income to auto dealers. The subprime crisis uh, was in part generated by the fact that mortgage, mortgage brokers, who are you know, the housing market's sort of middlemen, and who we think of as the agents for, the, for borrowers, um, actually tended to kind of um, serve their own interests or the interests of banks rather than the interests of the people um, who were actually borrowing the money. So they were able to originate, originate loans based on little or no no documentation. Um, they often brokered loans for more money than the brokers could actually afford and uh, than the borrowers could actually afford. And there are also myriad cases of outright fraud where they would basically just kind of change numbers, uh, sign false documents, and, and the like. And why did they do this? Well, they did this because more mortgage brokers were paid not on the basis of whether or not loans ended up getting repaid. They were not uh, ba uh, paid on the basis of whether or not the loans uh, turned out to be good investments. They were paid solely on the basis of how many loans they generated. Uh, not surprisingly, as a result, what did they do? They tried to generate as many loans as possible. Pensions. Another huge problem for us, uh, both in the corporate and in the um, government world. And here, too, the people that we count on to kind of represent our interests, um, the executives who shareholders count on to represent their interests and the representatives who voters count on to represent their interests, uh, have done a very poor job of managing our future uh, commitments to retirees. So look at com a company like General Motors. General Motors went bankrupt for a variety of reasons. But one of the reasons it went bankrupt was because it did such a poor, poor, poor job of managing its labor costs over time. So it ended up packing huge amounts of money into the pension fund. And the reason it did this, as Roger Lowenstein wrote, is that retiree benefits were a future cost. So when they were forced to choose between 
paying workers more in the present or deferring the cost to the future, executives inevitably found more slack in future budgets, if they even bothered to think about how much they were going to have to pay at all, than in present ones. And so what they did was they repeatedly offered richer pensions later in exchange for lower wages in the present. Government officials have engaged in kind of similar sort of shell games. This is especially true on the municipal and state level. So the classic case was the city of San Diego, um, which uh, ended up effectively almost putting itself into bankruptcy uh, because of its pension costs. San Diego, uh, the San Diego City Council had no desire to raise taxes in the present, um, but also had no desire to alienate uh, city workers. And so what, it basic, what they basically decided was that pensions became an ideal vehicle for funneling money to city workers without actually having to pay for them, since the workers weren't going to collect the pensions until uh, many years down the road. Now, in retrospect, these decisions look bad, but the interesting thing is that they also actually look bad at the moment they happened. Um, pensions are not actually hard things to calculate. Healthcare costs are more complicated because obviously they've skyrocketed in ways that maybe were not fully anticipatable a decade or, or two decades ago. But pensions are pretty simple. Um, it's relatively easy to do the math. You know, you have a sense of how long people are going to live. You have a sense of how much you're paying for, and therefore you have a sense of how much you should be putting away uh, in order to pay for those pensions. So it actually is, is, should be a relatively easy calculation to make. And yet, what these institutions did was consistently make promises they had to know they were not going to be able to keep. Um, you know, aging, having people get old, that's not really a new thing. Uh, it's happened for a long time. So when a, when a government makes or, or a company makes a pension promise, it also has a rough sense of how much it needs to set aside every year. That's what's nice about actuarial tables. They actually work pretty well when it comes, uh, when it comes to pensions. And yet whenever these tables, these actuarial tables, told the CEOs or government officials something that was uh, inconvenient, they basically just chose to ignore it. Um, when pension funds had a great year in the stock market, they uh, just spent the proceeds instead of putting them away in, a, in the kind of rainy day fund that, that you're supposed to have. Uh, when they needed to say that um, they owed less money than they actually did, they said, we're going to do better in the future. Our investments are going to do better in the future, um, which created the illusion that these pension, has created the illusion that pension funds were in better shape than they actually were. And the result is that both shareholders uh, and voters have found themselves on the hook for much greater, num uh, much greater sums of money than could ever, they could ever reasonably have thought they were going to end up being on the hook for. The greatest example, though, uh, and most painful, I think, for many of us, and most infuriating examples of the principal agent problem, though, have come from corporate America and Wall Street. Uh, so if you go back... A 11 or 12 years ago, if you look at, say, the case of, of Enron. Enron is, in some ways, probably the quintessential case of print the principal agent problem, because Enron shareholders were essentially funding, funneling tremendous amount of money to Enron, uh, even as Enron's executives were sort of funneling it outside the door uh, to special interest vehicles they had set up uh, to essentially run a kind of self-dealing game where they were lining their own pockets basically at the expense of Enron shareholders. So they had actually set up more than 3,000 special interest vehicles, um, and they actually had their chief financial officer, both being the chief financial officer of Enron and also running uh, an outside entity um, that basically did very little other than essentially protect the interests of executives at the expense of shareholders. CEOs across the board, of course, have been paid exceptional amounts of money um, in the last 20 years. So I was looking at an article that was written, actually, I guess it's almost 30 years ago now. It was uh, written in 1982, and the, uh, it was a Directors and Boards magazine. It's sort of the magazine for boards of directors. And um, the article was titled, Is Any CEO Worth $1 Million a Year? Uh, <laughs> Now, now it's probably more like, is any CEO worth, you know, $15 million a year or whatever? Uh, but the idea that uh, CEOs should be paid enormous sums of money has essentially become conventional wisdom in the corporate world. But the striking thing is that even with this, CEOs have not been content to kind of uh, just be content with the pay they get. Um, a classic example was Conrad Black, who um, there's actually a long article about him, somewhat... Um, kind of defense of him to some degree in Vanity Fair this, this month. But um, I don't know how many of you remember, Conrad Black was uh, uh, the CEO of a company called Hollinger, 
uh, which was a, uh, a newspaper company. And it was a company he had, had to help start, he had started and, and built. Um, and in 1994, Hollinger went public. In other words, it sold shares to, to outside investors. Now, Conrad Black retained voting control, so he still was able to make um, all the relevant decisions. He basically decided he was on the board of directors and the like. And he never actually worried much about outside investors. He behaved more like a kind of feudal lord than the CEO of a publicly traded enter uh, enterprise. So he and his partners took home millions of dollars on top of their salaries in what they call management fees. Um, they stuck kind of private jets, personal chauffeurs, household staff on the company's tab. Um, Black was working on a biography of, of FDR uh, while he was CEO of the company. And uh, while he was doing this, he had Hollinger pay $12 million for a collection of FDR memorabilia. Uh, and um, basically, he succumbed to what I think I, I would call kind of Hammer's syndrome, uh, which is named after Armin Hammer, who was the CEO of uh, a company called Occidental Petroleum. Hammer's syndrome is basically the failure of uh, people who run public companies to realize that the company isn't theirs, even if they started it, that it actually belongs to, uh, to shareholders. The chief symptom of Hammer Syndrome is a total inability to abide by the rules that are supposed to come into play when you run, uh, when you use other people's money. Uh, Armin Hammer, for instance, used Occidental's assets to buy a $5.8 million uh, Leonardo da Vinci notebook. Um, which Hammer actually renamed after himself. Whenever you hear references to the Hammer Codex, that's the one that Hammer shareholders actually paid for. Um, he used Occidental money to uh, finance an art museum named after himself and uh, to pay for the second volume of his autobiography. And he actually kept collect, even at long after he had retired, he kept collecting a million dollar salary. Um, in fact, he kept collecting the salary even after he died. I think it went to his estate, essentially. Um, and, and these kinds of things are surprisingly common even today uh, in, the corporate, in the corporate world. Now, this isn't just kind of garden variety greed of the sort that's pretty common among uh, executives of all sort. It's more a sense of kind of a what you call a droit de seigneur, you know, sort of a basically rights of the Lord. And in fact, Conrad Black, for instance, was very uh, clear about this. He once wrote to a Hollinger a colleague, I'm not prepared to reenact the French revolutionary renunciation of the rights of nobility, basically. Now, this same kind of thing manifests itself in, in the sort of severance package that uh, Leo Apotheker got, and that has become extraordinarily common in American corporate culture. In fact, uh, by um, some standards, Apotheker's severance package was relatively small. So you may remember a few years ago, Home Depot fired its CEO, Bob Nardelli. Uh, while Nardelli had been, had been head of the company, Home Depot's stock price actually fell about 6%. But Nardelli basically got a severance package of about $200 million. Um, now, his operating performance was not actually so bad. But even if it had been, it wouldn't have mattered. Um, his contract was primarily, was mostly guaranteed. And um, if, when he had a hard time meeting targets for his bonus, the board of directors basically just went and substituted a different one that was easier to meet. And while the size of that severance package was startling, the general arrangement, which you might call kind of um, heads I win, tails you lose, um, is far from unusual. In fact, even though you hear a lot of talk about restraining CEO pay, um, most board of directors compensation committees remain what Warren Buffett once called them, tail wagging puppy dogs, basically. Now, uh, in addition to corporate America, Wall Street is obviously a place where the principal agent problem has wreaked enormous damage. Uh, for the last, let's say, 15 years, um, agents have run wild while principals have basically uh, been screwed over time and again. Uh, and this manifests itself in a variety of ways. So Wall Street customers, um, the companies that do business with Wall Street uh, have oftentimes uh, been victimized by, by these arrangements. Um, remember in the late 1990s during the IPO boom. So one of the things that happened in the late 1990s um, was that uh, when companies went public, what the investment banks that were taking them public would do was they would take a hefty chunk of the shares that the company was going to issue and they would hand them out to favored customers. It was called spinning. They would basically give them out to, to, to other favored customers. And what that did was it created an incentive for the investment bank to price the IPOs at a lower price than they might otherwise be able to, than they might otherwise have been able to get. 
because what that did was it meant that if you had shares at the opening, you were able to kind of turn them right away, spin them, and um, to flip them and make a, a sizable chunk of change right away. And so what investment banks did was essentially use these as ways of getting new business. So you would essentially, to some client who you potentially wanted to you know, do a public offering for or, or a bond offering, you would basically dole out these shares to them and, um, and reap the benefits down the road. Uh, so in effect, the hundreds of millions of dollars that should have been going to the companies that were going public went instead into the pockets of privileged customers. In effect, investment banks were making bribes with other people's money. Uh, if they had actually been making the bribes with cash, uh, it probably would have been illegal. But in fact, the way it was set up, this actually was a, a perfectly reasonable way for them to actually do business. Stock market analysts, as you probably remember, um, oftentimes were tailoring their forecasts to win investment banking business. So this was the heart of the Wall Street scandals uh, that, Elliot, that sort of made Elliot Spitzer famous and, and people like Henry Blodgett and Jack Grubman infamous. Uh, so that you had a whole series of situations where analysts were bad-mouthing companies behind their back, bad-mouthing companies in their emails, uh, but in public actually telling customers that they should go out and buy these companies, that these companies were raging buys. Uh, and the result was the customers who trusted them ended up putting enormous amounts of money in companies that ended up going um, bust in many cases and, and, and uh, in other cases uh, losing 80 or 90 percent of their value. The financial crisis that, that we just lived through was in large part, I think, generated on the Wall Street side by the fact that the incentive system for both money managers and for employees of Wall Street firms are basically designed to create havoc for those institutions. So look, let's look at the way hedge fund managers, for instance, uh, are rewarded. So um, hedge fund managers are typically paid wh what's called 2 and 20. So they get 2% of their total assets as a management fee. So however much money they manage, they get 2% of that annually. And they keep 20% of their investment gains above some benchmark. So if you beat the S&P or whatever it is, you get 20% of your additional gains. And the idea is this is actually supposed to, in effect, kind of incentivize the hedge fund managers to act on behalf of their clients, right? Uh, in theory, you get rich only if your clients do. The problem that is in practice, it doesn't always work this way. So fund managers get bonus, bonuses at the end of every uh, calendar year. And they keep those performance fees even if the fund eventually goes south. So if you imagine a billion dollar hedge fund, so if it rises 20% in its first year and falls 20% in its second, its investors will actually be down. They will actually have lost money. But the hedge fund manager may well have earned $40 million in performance fees alone. In addition, he'd also have made money for, for the, in the uh, management fees. Now, there is a rule that's supposed to deal with this eventuality. Uh, if a hedge fund loses money, then the manager doesn't get any performance bonus going forward until investors get back, their, their, get back to even. The catch is that nothing prevents a hedge fund manager from shutting down after a bad year and walking away. And you keep all the fees that you've already accrued, and then basically you can actually go out and start a new fund if you actually want. Sometimes this happens out of necessity when the, the, the uh, two subprime funds at Bear Stearns, which actually started the financial crisis, went under. It was because basically their assets had essentially disappeared. But sometimes it happens because an invest a manager is so far underwater that they have no incentive to actually keep going. So the problem this creates is that because fund managers reap big rewards on the upside and they don't actually get punished on the downside to the degree that investors do, they have a much greater incentive to take big risks than actual investors might like them to. Um, and that's especially true because hedge funds often leverage their money with large amounts of borrowed cash. That makes it very easy for them to turn small gains into enormous ones, but it also allows them, uh, makes it easy for small losses to turn into enormous ones. And that's oftentimes why uh, hedge fund investors, you know, in a, in a down market are significantly punished. The situation is probably even worse inside Wall Street investment banks. In fact, one account, one plausible account of the financial crisis is that Wall Street employees, in effect, sabotaged their own companies because they were being paid to do so. It wasn't deliberately paid to do so, but that's basically the way things were working. Because 
uh, employees at these, at these firms were oftentimes rewarded on a short-term basis. And so their incentive was really not to look out for the long-term interests of shareholders. It was to look out for their own short-term interests, which meant generating as much business as possible without actually thinking about what was going to happen five years or even in some cases a year or two down the road. And so that's why many of these Wall Street investment banks ended up laden with enormous amounts of bad assets. You know, one of the great paradoxes of the financial crisis is that uh, when you go back and look at it, is that these Wall Street firms were not just making bad loans or doing bad deals and then dumping them on everyone else. Uh, if they had, we would not have had to do things like TARP and the rest. In fact, the real problem was that they ended up in some sense kind of getting stuck with their own crap, that it basically ended up, um, ended up on their own balance sheet. And they did so in large part because there was a real conflict between the long-term interest of the firm and its shareholders and the short-term interest of its employees. The agents, the people that were really supposed to be doing a good job of, of taking care of shareholders, uh, ended up doing a great job of taking care of themselves, um, while shareholders essentially uh, saw, saw most of their investments wiped out. Now, you could just say about all of this, this is just kind of the nature of the system. Um, or you could say that it's evidence of a kind of rise of greed in the United States or uh, newfound self-interested behavior. I don't think this critique is totally off base. Uh, there certainly has been an important shift in kind of social norms uh, in terms of the amount of money people are willing to make, in terms of uh, short-term, long-term interests, and the like. But the curious thing about this is that you don't actually see this kind of behavior everywhere in the U.S. economy. In fact, there's actually a really dramatic difference between what you see happening in the kind of I don't know, we could call it the service economy, but let's say the economy where these principal agent conflicts are very important, and what's happening in uh, what you could call the real economy. I sh you shouldn't really call it that, but the economy of, let's say, goods, um, of, of manufacturing and the like. Um, in the part of the economy where principal agent problems are pervasive, uh, principles, and you know, it might be as consumers, it may be as borrowers, it may be as shareholders, uh, it may be as lenders. If you're lending money to these banks, you oftentimes would sort of screwed over as well. You oftentimes feel exploited, I think. You feel like other people are profiting at your expense. And you're right to feel like that. You feel like you're spending more and getting less. And not coincidentally, in that part of the economy, the agents are getting enormously wealthy. You know, if you look at the rise of uh, inequality in the United States, um, it's largely concentrated in those sectors. On the other hand, if you look at the part of the economy um, that's sort of a more traditional consumer economy, um, the opposite is true. Uh, if you actually look at the market for, let's say, like computer technology or televisions or automobiles or appliances, in all of these cases, um, I would make the case that actually in those cases we're spending less and we're actually getting more that actually in, all, in, in most of those cases, the products that are being made today are actually better than they used to be. Um, they're more reliable. Uh, they deliver better value for money. Um, in fact, when it comes to most manufactured goods, these are the good old days. Uh, products are, are more durable than they used to be. Uh, in, a, in a survey a, a few years ago, Consumer Reports found that in most product categories, repair rates were just like between 10 and 20 percent, which is very low historically. The average life of a car is about um, up about 50% since 1970. They last about 50% longer. Um, uh, think about how much cheaper something like a DVD player is than it was, you know, I don't know if people even have DVD players anymore, much cheaper than it was um, even five or six, five or six years ago. Um, I was talking to the managing editor of Consumer Reports, and, and he said, you know, you don't find the kinds of things that you used to find decades ago, like toasters that could electrocute you or TVs that blew up, basically. Um, if you buy a TV, you're going to get a good picture, he said, and if you buy a stereo, you're going to get great sound. He, said, he actually said that the guy who used to test stereos for them said to him once, he said, you know, you can't buy a bad stereo anymore, he said. They just don't make the parts anymore, basically. Um, now, this is largely the result, I think, of uh, a combination of consumers being ever more demanding uh, and the fact that there's a lot more information out there for consumers to, to draw on. But it's also a function of the fact that in this part of the economy, it's relatively easy 
for consumers to recognize when something isn't going the way it's supposed to. So if a television set, if a television set doesn't work well, you know it. Um, you know, you don't know how to build, well, some of you may, but you don't know how to build television sets, but you know, you know, whether or not they wor they're working reasonably well. And if, 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 you're, if you don't have a really good sense of it or if you're trying to decide in advance what to buy, um, you know, you have places like Consumer Reports or nowadays you have the net. So there's an explosion in information that has become available to consumers and that you can draw on. Uh, even before you walk into a store. Now, there are obviously still like those electronic stores on whatever, 42nd Street, um, you know, basically trying to, to sell crappy goods to you and the like. But, but the truth is that consumers are on the whole much better informed than ever before. They have many more choices than ever before. Competition is obviously massively increased in these fields. And the result is really what I kind of think of as a sort of inexorable rise of quality. And, and the result is that if you're a middleman in this business, if you're an agent in those businesses, uh, you actually have a much harder time making money uh, than you used to. Uh, it's, it's a really, it's a kind of nonstop treadmill. You have to keep performing. Because if you mess up, people are very happy and very willing to go somewhere else, right? That's why companies like Circuit City went out of business. Because if you didn't provide value, uh, customers were no longer going to, no, are no longer going to, to come to you. And so it's much harder for people in these businesses to get enormously wealthy. You can do it. Steve Jobs obviously did it. Um, Jeff Bezos has done it. But you ha you, the only way to do it is to actually really give people what they're looking for. And this is profoundly different from what is happening in these other industries where principal agent relationships, domi relationships dominate. So the question is why? Why is that the case? Why are things so much worse on Wall Street? Why are things so much worse in, in other areas? Some part of it is just ignorance, right? It's, it's, there aren't that many people who understand, you know, let's say, how pension benefits work. Um, there aren't that many people who really have a sense of exactly what it takes, um, uh, what the difference is between a good investment and a bad investment. And, and to be fair, institutions are very good at, at covering up what they're doing, uh, to actually pretend that things are uh, going better than, than they are. Um, you know, the level of people's ignorance in a lot of these areas is pretty immense. Medicine, obviously, is one, um, but, you know, financial literacy. Uh, we're required, uh, today's world, we're required to manage our money uh, much more than ever before. Uh, but most of us have a really hard time doing that well just because we don't know that much. So if you look at surveys, a sizable percentage of people believe, for instance, that um, mortgage brokers are legally required to actually give them the best price on a mortgage. That is not true. Uh, and, and one of the real challenges is that the less people know, the more overconfident they actually tend to be. So this is actually called um, something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And uh, what it actually describes is that people who don't know that much actually don't know that they're ignorant. And the problem is that as a result, they actually fail to seek out information that might help them. Uh, and you know, there was a study that was done by the um, Atlanta Federal Reserve. They actually looked at uh, people's level of financial literacy, and then they looked at, at how they went about the process of getting a mortgage. The people who knew less were actually most likely to do no research before actually going out and trying to get a mortgage. Um, by contrast, the more informed you are, the more likely you are actually to go out and ask others for help. So this kind of, you know, basically essentially feeds on itself. But on top of ignorance, there's also obviously the simple level of, of kind of a, a, what you might call willed ignorance. Um, that in many cases we're sort of willing to actually uh, uh, put our, our faith unwantedly uh, in people. Enron is a classic example of that. Enron was actually, um, the way I kind of put it, um, openly closed mouthed. So they were very clear about the fact that they were not telling you what they were actually doing. Uh, its financial statements were pretty much impenetrable. Uh, it kept talking about new businesses that it was expanding into, basically said nothing about how those businesses were doing. Um, its financial statements were almost like self-parody. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the annual report, its last annual report, it had 3,000 subsidiary or limited partner interests, and many of them were chartered in the Cayman Islands, uh, which might have been a signal to investors to worry. Uh, but in fact, and people just kept giving them, kept giving them money. On top of that, what, print, what agents are able to trade on in many of these fields is what I think of as a kind of unjustified faith that we have in experts, someone who's able to sort of identify themselves as an expert, and, and an and a unwillingness to change in response to evidence 
that the experts know less than we think they will. The quintessential case of this is, is Wall Street. So one of the really striking things about Wall Street, the financial crisis we just lived through, is that in effect these banks were committing many of the same sins that they had committed during the internet boom. Uh, they basically were acting in their own interests rather than the interests of shareholders. They were uh, saying things to customers that uh, did, were not actually true and that were clearly not in the best financial interests of customers. Uh, they were feathering their own nests um, at the expense of everyone else's. Uh, and yet the reaction on the part of many people, both customers and investors, was how could this have happened uh, when in fact the, the exact same thing had happened uh, only a short time before? And I think that there is this strange kind of willingness to forget, a strange, almost willed amnesia uh, on, the part of, uh, on the part of investors, especially in a situation where you think you're going to be able to make money. The same is true uh, of our faith in CEOs. If you actually look at the um, evidence, the, the evidence suggests that, that the, the super manager, you know, the CEO who kind of is able to leap from industry to industry in a single bound uh, and transform companies uh, into high-performing organizations is, for the most part, the stuff of myth. And in fact, it goes beyond that. Uh, reams of academic literature suggest that with rare exceptions, the same rule applies to CEOs as it does to money managers. That is, past performance is no predictor of future results. But companies throw away millions of dollars uh, on a regular basis on the assumption that because someone has done well in the past, they necessarily are going to do well in the future. It goes beyond that. Companies in the last 15 years have also become obsessed with hiring big name CEOs rather than um, promoting from within. And so the question, you know, why do they do this? Um, they do this partly because it allows them to sort of cover their ass. If things go wrong, at least the board can say, you know, well, we went wrong with this high-profile high profile guy. But it also is because I think people have really bought into this idea that there's an enormous shortage of talent and that the, the ability to run a company is incredibly rare. One of the real paradoxes is that ever more and more people go to business school than ever before. Uh, people are much better equipped to run companies than they ever have been. And yet uh, CEOs are paid as if they, they are incredibly ra ever rarer birds. The two things don't actually fit together. And yet I think this cult of expertise, this cult of talent, turns out to be incredibly difficult to eradicate. Now, the challenge is basically, how do we change this? How do we actually fix the principal-agent relationship problem? The key, obviously, is figuring out a way to kind of design incentives or to change uh, the behavior of agents. But it turns out to be much tougher than you might think, because a lot of the tools we have used in the past turn out to be much less effective and, in some cases, actually counterproductive uh, than we actually hoped they would. So let's take disclosure. So disclosure or transparency is typically seen as a good way of dealing with this problem, right? If, if customers or investors knew what was actually happening, then we would be much better equipped to actually make informed decisions. And obviously more information is typically a good thing. And Louis Brandeis, who wrote The Other, People, Other People's Money, he was famous for saying sunlight is the best antiseptic. So this is really the idea that transparency is a solution. The problem is that, as it turns out, transparency uh, and disclosure, we don't react to it in quite the way you might think. It doesn't actually off make a difference oftentimes in our actual behavior. There's a great experiment that was done to demonstrate this by uh, a behavioral economist. He's actually a psychologist named George Lowenstein and, uh, and a guy named Don Moore. And what they did was they set up this experiment that worked like this. So you had one group of people. They were called the estimators. And they were asked to look at several jars of coins from a distance. And they were asked to estimate the value of each coin, of the coin in each jar. The more accurate their estimates, they were paid more. Okay? So they had an incentive to actually do a good job of, of doing this. Then there was another group of people. Um, they were called advisors. Okay? The advisors were able to get closer to the jars. So they were able to get up close to the jars. And then they were able to give the estimators advice. Okay, so they basically were in the sort of like you know investment advisors in, in some way. But the advisors got paid not according to whether or not the estimators were accurate. They got paid according to how high the estimators' guesses were. Okay? So, all right. 
so you know what the incentive was, right? So the incentive was for them to tell the estimators that there were more coins in the jar than they actually thought or whatever. Their, their incentive was to give effectively misleading advice. And not surprisingly, when the estimators actually listened to the advisors, the guesses were, in fact, higher. But the really remarkable thing was that what they then did was so they set up they did the experiment, then they ran it again, and they told the estimators this time what the deal was with the advisors. They actually said the advisors have this conflict of interest. You know, they have this incentive. They're getting paid to do this. The striking thing is that it didn't matter. The estimators continued to guess higher. They continued to listen to the advisor's advice and to regard it as, as if the advisors were actually honest and unbiased people. Full disclosure did not actually make them uh, any more skeptical. And Lowenstein explained this by saying basically that in effect, he thought that the disclosure made them think that the advisors would necessarily take that into, a, into account and know, and therefore that they would be more honest. That once the, the information was disclosed, uh, the estimators were able to assume that it no longer, in effect, made a difference. But it actually goes further than this, actually even more troubling, which is that during the course of the experiment, Lowenstein discovered something that he had not expected. The disclosure, in some cases, not all, may actually do harm. Because once the conflicts of interest were disclosed, the advisor's advice got worse. So basically, they just actually amped up their bad advice because I guess they figured the estimators will take it into account, scale back down, so I'm just going to. And as Lowenstein so told me, he said, it's as if people said, you know the score, so now anything goes, basically. So full disclosure by itself may actually have the perverse effect of making people behave worse rather than better. Now, that doesn't mean that we should go back to the days of no transparency. It just means we need to recognize the limits of disclosure. It's also the case that disclosure and sort of hyper and regulation um, also runs the risk of, of, of the problem of what we sometimes call um, risk compensation. So risk compensation was, uh, uh, I think, first discovered or, or mo made most famous in a study of um, German drivers, I think they were actually taxi cab drivers, uh, who had anti-lock brakes installed on their cars. And, and, and they did a study of, of how their driving behavior changed. And what they found was that mysteriously, the, uh, even though anti-lock brakes are, are tremendously useful um, in improving safety, that actually they, the, the rate of accidents did not drop. And the reason why they realized was that uh, the drivers were reacting to the anti addition of the anti-lock brakes by going faster and driving more recklessly. And that, in effect, they almost attained a kind of equilibrium. Uh, it almost seems that in some situations, if a given behavior seems less risky than it did before, people actually compensate by doing it in a more risky fashion. So if you improve road lighting or install anti like brakes, you drive faster and more recklessly. If you spend a lot of money on flood control, um, people build further out on the floodplain. And it may also be the case that if you uh, try to convince people that um, you know, the financial system is safer than it was before, they're going to be more they're going to be less willing to kind of do the due diligence they need to because they're going to assume that someone else is doing it uh, for them. So the other problem you run into, so that so disclosure regulation have limits. The traditional method that economists have said we can sort of fix this principal agent problem is basically by fixing compensation. So what you want to do is try to align the interests of the agent and the principal in some way. And the classic tool they used to do this was stock options, right? Stock options seem like the, the, the best way to align interests. Because stock options basically seem to make executives, um, given executives the same interest as shareholders. They want the stock price to actually go up. And ensures that CEOs, instead of feathering their own nests, will think about the bottom line and profits and, and do their best they can to, to actually make stock prices uh, go up. But as it turns out, they don't actually have this effect, at least not in the way you think. And the reason is it actually is somewhat similar to the, to the hedge fund manager thing. The way an, an option works, as most of you probably know, but basically it works, you set a, a strike price, right? And if the, when the option um, comes due, uh, if the stock price, if the company's stock price is above the strike price, then you can sell it and reap a profit. If it's below the stock price, you get nothing. The option expires valueless. The key is that it doesn't matter how far below the stock price um, 
the strike, how, low, how far below the strike price the stock price is. If it's $20 below it, the option is valueless. If it's $1 below it, the option is valueless. It doesn't make a difference to the person who actually has the stock option. But to a shareholder, the difference in a stock that's at $30 and one that's at $20, that's a big difference, right? Uh, but to uh, uh, a, um, uh, an executive who has options, it may not make any difference at all. And so the result is that what you end up with are CEOs who are much more likely to embrace projects that, in, that, that could result in big rewards, even if they also entail a significant chance of failure. And as a result, it's not surprising then if you actually look at studies. So look at the study that was done uh, of about 1,000 companies by um, two management professors. And what they found was that CEOs whose compensation was made up mostly of stock options, they tended to you know, swing for the fences. So they tended to make investments and acquisitions that were much riskier than those made by other executives. The result was that the performance of those companies was much more volatile. It rose and fell much more often. And it was not for the good of the companies either. The risky strategies were actually more likely to end up in big failures than in big gains. Generous option gra grants also seem to encourage fraud. So a study that was done of hundreds of firms that were forced to restate earnings or after accounting irregularities found that companies that paid out most of their compensation in options were far more likely to end up restating earnings than other ones. On top of that, there's a bigger, more basic problem, which is that the amount of money that CEOs are now being paid is so immense that they can actually fail completely and still walk away with huge sums of money. So one of the mysteries of the financial crisis, if you think about it, is what you sometimes hear uh, is you know, that, that basically bankers were not punished uh, after in the wake of the financial crisis, that you know, essentially they're all still in power, et cetera, et cetera. The reality is if you actually look at what happened to individual bankers, um, the CEO of Citigroup fired. The CEO of Merrill Lynch was fired. The CEO of Bank of America was fired. Um, the the co-CEO of Bear Stearns was fired. The firm itself obviously pretty much vanished. The, everybody at Lehman Brothers, basically, that company um, went in, up in smokes. The CEO obviously was was was, um, was fired with the company. Uh, the CEO of Wachovia was fired. The CEO of Washington Mutual was fired. So in all these cases, these these guys all lost their jobs. Um, they lost all of their future income at those companies, uh, et cetera. You might have thought that you know, the prospect of keeping your job, especially when you were paid so well, uh, would have been a check on reckless behavior. Um, certainly that's the way it works for most people. You know, one of the checks on having somebody slack off too much or one of the things that keeps us working is because we want to keep our jobs if we like them at all. Um, and so you might think for a CEO it would have the same kind of effect. But when you actually look at how C these CEOs made these decisions, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that they were actually behaving in a way that was essentially indifferent to the future survival, um, either of themselves or of their firms. And, and I think one of the reasons why this kind of behavior is not that surprising is that they were paid so much money that, in effect, it didn't really matter. The classic case of this is Dick Fold, who Dick Fold lost something like $700 million when Lehman Brothers went out of business. But he took something like $500 million out of the company in the five years leading up to Lehman Brothers' failure. And in that case, you can kind of understand why he didn't, was not sort of scared of engaging in risky behavior. Similarly, look at Stan O'Neill. Stan O'Neill was you know, forced to resign as the CEO of Merrill Lynch uh, after the company lost billions upon billions of dollars under his, under his tenure. But he made $84 million in 2005 and 2006, and he did so largely because of the profits Merrill made and booked because of its forays into the subprime market, the market that eventually, uh, in effect, obliterated the company. Uh, Chuck Prince at Citigroup, the same kind of phenomenon. He made tens of millions of dollars uh, by presiding over these bad decisions. And actually, when he, when he was fired, he walked away with another uh, 15 or $20 million in severance pay. None of that money was given back. And so there's so much money at stake uh, that, in effect, the long term basically vanishes. On top of that, there's some interesting evidence to suggest that really high pay may actually make decisions worse, not better. 
So there was a study that was done by Dan Ariely, who some of you probably know is a behavioral economist, uh, psychologist, who um, wrote a book called Predictably Irrational. And he did a study where he actually um, went to India, and he actually um, ran a study in which if people were pay, did well at a, certain, at a certain task, they could actually make as much as uh, almost half of the annual income in the communities where, where they were living. That this, these were relatively poor communities, and these people could make uh, quite a bit of money. Um, and, but he basically had three kind of pay schemes. So there was a low pay scheme, there was a medium pay scheme, and then there was a high pay scheme. And he asked people to do these tasks. Some of the tasks were, much, were kind of rote tasks, relatively easy to do. And some of them involved uh, cognitive uh, skills. So they were a little more, they were more complex. And he actually did the same uh, experiment with MIT students. Again, low, medium, and high pay. Um, the amount of pay was less, but it still was relatively uh, substantial. And what he actually found, interestingly, was there was no meaningful difference between uh, how people did based on whether or not they got low pay or medium pay. They did well doing both of those. But, but in many, of the, many cases, people actually did worse when they got paid more. And the reason why he hypothesized was that actually high pay uh, does two things. One is it draws your attention to the pay so that you're kind of obsessed with how much you might make. And it sort of draws your uh, cognitive abilities away a little bit in that regard. The other thing is that it actually makes you pay, uh, it actually kind of gets you too aroused. It gets you too excited. And there's a lot of evidence uh, that um, there's an optimal level of arousal, that you want people to be aroused to a certain point but no further, uh, if you actually want them to do well at certain tasks. This is what's usually called the yerkes dodson law. And it was uh, actually invented in 1908. And it was actually done, um, it, was, it was deduced from uh, watching rats. I guess being compared to rats is, well, it makes sense. <laughs> so the way, uh, the, the, the experiment they did was they put rats in a cage. And they asked them to explore, uh, uh, or forced, I guess, them to explore one, or two pass one of two passages. Um, and on uh, each trial, they would hang either a white card, they would hang a white card in one passage, and they would hang a black card in another passage. Um, if you went to the white card, you got a reward. If you went to the black card, you got a shock. Now, for some rats, the shock was very small. Uh, for others, it was medium. And for others, it was really strong. And the interesting thing was that what the rats did was the rats learned to avoid the shocks much more quickly when the shocks were at that intermediate level of intensity. So when the shock wa shocks were too low or too high, they actually didn't learn as fast to avoid them. And they actually have shown similar things with human beings. Um, and uh, you know, looking at the effects of things like stimulants, muscle, muscle tension, or in fact, electric shots. Shocks. In all these cases, there seems to be an optimal level of arousal. You want people to be aware and intense, but not too intense. And it seems possible that in some cases, if you actually give people too much incentive to perform, that they actually are going to do worse uh, rather than better. Now, I typically like to end my columns and the way I think um, with some kind of optimistic solution. Uh, I actually have a, a harder time doing that in this case uh, because I think that the principal agent relationship is uh, both incredibly important in the way the economy is working right now and also, as we've just seen, incredibly difficult to resolve well. But I think that there are some ideas that would help. Uh, I think the first is that actually shifting for investors to shift their attention in a meaningful way toward more long-term horizons could actually make a real difference in terms of uh, the way we set up incentive schemes. So I think within corporations, um, there are some companies that are already experimenting with this. So when they hand out stock options or stock grants, uh, they set it up so that you're not allowed to cash those out for uh, four or five years down the road. Uh, changes like that can actually make uh, potentially a meaningful difference. Um, if you think about fields like medicine, um, shifting away from a straight fee-for-service uh, model toward a more holistic one, so one where doctors are actually rewarded on the basis of the health of their patients. Very difficult to design incentive schemes like that, but to the extent that we can do that, um, 
I think we'll be more successful in actually both holding down medical costs and also potentially uh, actually getting better results from the system uh, as a whole. You don't want to set, you know, simple budget things and then force doctors to kind of fit into those because if you do that, basically what you get is just less care. Um, but finding a balance between the two. I also think salary plus bonus models um, oftentimes can be quite effective in that, in that regard. Uh, in terms of, of, you know, investors and consumers, literacy, financial literacy, uh, improving the literacy can actually make a difference. Although I think in large part all we want to do is just get people to the point where they know what they don't know. If you just can get people to the point where they realize how ignorant they are, it actually would simply um, make an actual, an actual difference. In some cases, regulation can make a difference. I actually think that there are certain kinds of behaviors that should just be essentially regulated out of existence rather than assuming that disclosure will actually make a difference. But I think the last thing I would say, and the most important thing in some way, is that the thing we need to recognize is that as principles, in whatever form, whether as investors, whether as, as uh, uh, lenders, whether as the members of boards of directors, and as consumers, you simply have to do more work than um, we're used to doing. I mean, one of the really striking things over the last decade, especially when it comes to, let's say, something like CEO pay, is that there have, in fact, been new rules put in place that are supposed to provide a check on CEO excesses. So um, investors now have a say on pay at many companies. You can actually vote uh, and evaluate um, compensation uh, contracts. They have more authority to actually throw uh, bad boards of directors out. And yet the reality is, is that in many cases, investors don't choose to exercise this. Most shareholders don't bother to vote. Um, uh, uh, most say on pay uh, votes are basically overwhelmingly passed in favor of the contracts. And while you could say this is just evidence that investors are happy, I think it's more evidence that um, we basically just succumb to inertia and laziness in many situations. And I think the real challenge uh, for principals is that if, you want, if we want a better system, uh, it actually is incumbent on us to actually do the work that's necessary, um, that's necessary to, to get that system. Um, the way I kind of think about it in the simple terms is if the middleman or the agent offend me, it's really time for us to basically go ahead and cut him or her out. Thank you very much. Okay, um, how about questions uh, about this subject or any other? I guess we are going to have mics and um, come forward and just ask. Is it just one mic or? Okay, we're going to have two. Go ahead. Uh, on the topic of HP, I was wondering what you think about Meg Whitman. Uh, yeah, so interesting question. Um, so Meg Whitman uh, was um, the, is the new CEO of Hewlett Packard. She was uh, named to replace Apotheker. And um, uh, the, I, I have a couple of thoughts. One is um, Meg Whitman did, especially in her early years at eBay, a very good job, I think, at that company um, in managing the tradition away from, uh, from um, its founder, Piero Midyar. Um, but I think it's also clear that the longer Whitman stayed at eBay, the worse the company's performance became. And then in a lot of ways, I think she became somewhat complacent, that there were uh, a lot of opportunities that they missed, um, and there were things that they didn't uh, see happening, uh, most particularly the transition away from auctions. Um, and, and I actually wrote, recently wrote a piece for Wired about this, about the kind of the death of the auction, I and mean, death is overstating it. But as eBay became, you know, more and more dominated by um, fixed price deals, um, I think Whitman wasn't really in tune with that. Um, on the other hand, and obviously her run for governor was not exactly the most <laughs> convincing demonstration of executive ability, but there is one good thing I would say about this. Um, uh, well, no, let me say the second bad thing. The second bad thing is that Meg Whitman was on Hewlett Packard's board, and there's something disturbing about the fact that Hewlett Packard just decided, after having made one bad decision quickly, that they would make a second decision very quickly and just go ahead and basically hire Meg Whitman because they knew her. I mean, they didn't say that's why they did it, but basically, you know, she was. I guess just sitting next to them. Um, but I will say the one good thing about the contract they designed in terms of what we've been talking about is that the contract is, her contract, although it, 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 it will potentially be a very lucrative one, is relatively reasonably designed from an incentive point of view. So it really is pretty performance driven. 
uh, the, the, the targets are reasonable. Um, she's not being paid a tremendous amount of money up front, and she is not uh, going to be entitled to massive severance if she actually um, is fired. So th all those things, I think, are, are reasonably good. But I have to say, I think if you're Hewlett, a Hewlett Packard shareholder, there's something very disturbing about the idea that they basically decided who was going to run your company in like 12 minutes. I'm sort of overstating it, but there's something kind of just really what feels careless about that. So thanks. I have two questions sure. which uh, both look to the ending part of your talk about solutions. Uh, the first is, what about the fiduciary rule? We've had uh, essentially eight centuries of that in Anglo-Saxon law for trusts. We've had 30, 40 years of it for the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. And it's pretty fierce, at least in the ERISA level, because it's both civil and criminal. Right. The second is kind of aligned with it, which is how do you like the alignment of interest in the venture capital IPO, uh, uh, venture capital inventor world, at least before the IPO, where their interest would seem to be aligned? Do, does either the technical, legal, or that early investor alignment work for you? Yeah, I actually think venture capital is a place where, uh, I mean, there are obviously to some degree conflicts about, um, well, as you said, with IPOs in particular, about exit strategy typically, well, venture capitalists oftentimes have an interest for the company perhaps to go public sooner than, than the, the CEO or, or um, uh, other, other people at the company might like, but, but in general I think that that actually is a relatively good alignment where both have an interest in building long-term value um, and at least the way the venture capital industry in, in the United States has worked, I th you know, the results have been pretty impressive. I, venture capital has other problems I think right now, um, uh, primarily, well in some ways too much money uh, uh, given the, the opportunities, but, um, uh, but I think in general it does. The fiduciary point is a really good one, uh, and, and I think uh, one of the, the problems is that um, people oftentimes think there's a fiduciary re relationship when there actually isn't one. Um, and, uh, but I think the idea of expanding um, the fiduciary rule to other kinds of relationships, something that's been, that's been floated in a lot of situations, and, and uh, although I think politically it's very hard to imagine it happening at the moment, um, I think it's actually, uh, um, you know, a potentially useful one. The classic case would be, stock, you know, the, the relationship between, say, analysts and and, uh, um, and uh, investors or the like. I think that, that you know, that would be something that, 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 might, that could make a difference. Um, uh, I think it doesn't solve the issues entirely, uh, partly because it's, you know, somewhat difficult to evaluate in some cases is an investment made because it's bad or because it's, you know, criminal. Um, but I think that, um, you know, it could, it could certainly help, I think. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I wondered if you could comment briefly on whether you thought that shifting from a model where uh, investment managers are compensated based on the amount of assets that they have and with an incentive fee to a model where they're compensated more like attorneys where they're paid hourly and whether or not that may have a big impact on the way investment decisions are made. That you think it would be better to actually pay them on a kind of salary on an hourly basis. basis. Yeah. yeah. Because so you have these weird as asymmetries where investors have incentives to take risks over the short term, they can make uh, large compensation, let's say being up four years, taking lots of risk, take 20% of that if they're a hedge fund, right. accumulate a lot of assets, and then they could have performance like, say, John Paulson's this year, where they're down 35% on a much bigger asset Base, basis. But so still they, getting the management fees right. of 2% and, and, and we, the like. We also know that, that uh, investment returns are negatively correlated with high fees. Right. So uh, it's, it's a fascinating idea. I mean, obviously, the, 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 the fear, if you, uh, is, in effect, it's actually very similar to the CEO problem, right, the, to the, the, the pre-stock option kind of CEO model. The fear is that if you do that, then you end up with bureaucrats and clock punchers, basically, um, who are effectively doing this and, and um, uh, just to, you know, they don't have an incentive to outperform and, and the rest. Um, but... Uh, on an, and on an investment fund basis, I certainly think there's some model that, that needs to replace what we have um, because I think that uh, it's uh, not really as effective as, as it could be. But I actually think that the other thing I would say is, um, you know, the, the balance between us, 
maybe a balance between salary and bonus is actually something closer to what you're looking at. I mean, that's, you know, the danger with just salaries is actually you're seeing it with Wall Street firms and, and European banks right now. So in the wake of the financial crisis and the backlash against the huge salaries, um, uh, the huge bonuses, basically people said, okay, let's just pay a lot out in salary and reduce performance pay. But what you're dealing with now is a situation in which banks are dramatically underperforming, um, cutting, you know, uh, and, uh, cutting their employees and the like, and yet people are still getting paid very, very sizable salaries. And so I think that, you know, striking that balance is is really the question. But I think that it's certainly something that investors, um, part of it depends on what investors want. I mean, I think that, you know, in a way, one of the reasons why the existing model it, it works is because a lot of investors are just gambling in some in some sense. Um, but, I, but I think that, you know, this issue of really, uh, Incentivizing outperformance in the short term and, in effect, incentivizing underperformance in the long term is, is a huge issue, I think. And I, I actually don't have as much of a problem with the hourly model as a lot of people do, I think. So, yeah. Two quick, two quick questions. Um, first, would going back to making investment banks legal partnerships versus corporations uh, make a lot of sense? And then if you could just comment on too big to fail, I mean, how that factors into your analysis. It seems like things have gotten even bigger. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's, those are both great questions. And in fact, the first one is something that, um, uh, that I think is, is very important. So um, it's very important in the simple sense that um, in a, in a, when, when investment banks were structured as partnerships, not to tell you anything you don't know, but when they were structured as partnerships and partners had to put up the capital for the actual investments that, um, banker, that the banks were making, there was obviously a much tighter connection between what they were doing and the actual and, and, and the interests of the firm. Um, the alignment was much stronger. Now, there, there were still issues, obviously, with employees and the like, um, uh, but uh, th th I think it's, it's safe to say that their, ri the, the, their willingness to take risks was, was smaller. Um, and in fact, it goes beyond that because I think um, in going public, not only did it uh, dissociate them to some degree from the consequences of their actions, it also magnified their access to capital. So they just gave them a lot more money to play with, which created these other problems that I was talking about. I mean, you know, it's sort of un the amount of money people have been making is unimaginable in a partnership. Well, maybe not unimaginable, but hard to imagine in a partnership structure, uh, just because it's hard to get that kind of that kind of leverage. Um, it's hard to imagine they would be willing to take that kind of risks with, with their own money. So I think that that actually um, does, make, um, does make a big difference. On the too big to fail front, I actually think it uh, was and is less important. Well, I shouldn't say is. I certainly think it was less important uh, in shaping people's decision making than most people think it was. And the reason for that is that um, I, I think the fundamental problem in the investment banks was not a question of, uh, banks being, bankers being willing to, uh, bankers thinking about their own institutions and saying we could fail, but if we do, the bank will be bailed out and survive, so therefore I don't really, it doesn't really matter. I think it was really a case primarily of bankers pursuing their own self-interest at the expense of, or while indifferent to, the interests of the institution. Um, because obviously from the perspective of the institution, too big to fail, uh, keeps you alive, but it certainly leaves you decimated. I mean, just take, I mean, Citigroup, uh, I think its stock is still somewhere like maybe only, I think it's down 90% from its all-time high. Bank of America is down probably 80, 85%. So they survived, but they certainly didn't really, it, it's not a survival anyone was really, in, any shareholder is really happy with. And so I think that, um, uh, I think that the fact that in order to, to, to get to the point where you're saved, you have to be so ground down that you know, you're in, you're, your financials are, are an enormously bad case. It means it's hard to imagine that CEOs were sitting around saying, uh, I don't really care if we get that close to failure um, because we'll be saved. The other reason I think it didn't really have a big impact is I actually think um, the, the part of what happened was basically that CEOs just kind of drank their own Kool-Aid and were just convinced of their own genius and didn't quite didn't really foresee how awful their decisions would be. Um, you know, to really believe too big to fail has a huge impact on decision making, you have to think that people are willing to say, we, there's a good chance we're going to fail, and then we'll be bailed out. I don't think most people even got to that point. Now, going forward, it may be, that may not be the case. Um, it may be that, that having seen these bailouts, uh, that people will say, you know, are, are more likely to do that. But 
I, I don't actually know. I, I think it's kind of a tough, tough one, tough one to say. But I think the real issue here is that individual bankers knew that even if they failed, they could still walk away with huge sums of money. It's kind of a fine distinction, but that's what I would, that's what I would say. So, thanks. Yeah. Yes, if you're not in the financial sector, it seems like the volume of financial information you see if you're a shareholder is pretty overwhelming. Yeah. So, um, and, and so the tendency is to ignore it. Yeah. What would the five or six things to look for uh, yeah. be, do you think? It's a great question. Um, I think, you know, the first piece of advice might be uh, don't actually invest your money actively. Um, that actually, you know, that index funds are a good thing. The problem is it's hard to, it's hard to put your money in index funds, especially after, you know, we're, we're down 40 percent. And um, it's, but, it, but it's hard. It's hard, you know, for, we know it's hard for mutual fund managers to consistently beat the indexes. Um, the first thing I would say is don't trade in and out um, on a uh, regular basis trying to beat, trying to time the market. I think that's a, next to impossible for ordinary investors um, to do. So I actually think uh, one of the best things you can do is um, pay less attention to um, the up and down gyrations of the market than, uh, than um, most people do. I say that even though I pay, have to pay enormous attention to the up and down gyrations of the market and um, much to my detriment um, as an investor. Well, so, <laughs> assuming that you actually do have the giant pile of paper yeah. right there in front of you and for various reasons it's necessary to read the giant pile of paper. Yeah. What, what would, do you think? What would five, you actually look for? What would you pay attention to that would just well, I actually, raise a flag? If for I you? can actually be specific, I would actually be very. I'll be very specific. Um, I think it's really it's useful to look at um, uh, return on invested capital. So that's a that's a, sim a statistic. It's at this point relatively easy to find. I think that that's um, uh, a, a really useful measure of how efficiently companies are using the money investors are giving them. I think that's a really useful, um, it's, a, it's a statistic that's hard to, to distort and, and it's, hard to, um, it's hard to corrupt. Um, I think uh, uh, if, um, I think financial statements uh, that are uh, next to impossible to understand that are not written in plain English are probably a warning sign. Um, companies, some companies are very good at explaining what they're doing, other companies are not. I think that that's actually something um, that, I would, um, that I would look to. Uh, I actually think um, a lot of CEO turnover is a bad, is a bad sign. Um, I think that that's a sign uh, of a uh, board of directors that's, you know, basically, you know, essentially somewhat hysterical and not, and not, not useful. Um, and then I guess the other thing I would, sim I would look to, which is uh, relatively useful, is just earnings growth relative to, um, to uh, debt. So if you look at companies that are taking on a lot of debt and getting earnings growth, then worry. Um, but it, I think if a company is getting earnings growth organically, that would be something else to look So to. a lot of footnotes might be a problem. Huh? Yeah, I would also think, yeah, a tremendous number of footnotes <laughs> is a good sign that you might worry. So, okay, thanks. I uh, think that you're putting your finger on uh, conflicts of interest as the great problem is, is, okay. is absolutely correct. I, I think that you're charmingly naive uh, if you really think that uh, every individual uh, uh, paying attention to how those conflicts are managed by, by his money manager or his corporation uh, is going to do the trick. I, I think we need strong legislation and, and more strong legislation than we've gotten so far. I think perhaps we should have, uh, uh, and I'm, I guess uh, I ask you if you agree that uh, we should have, instead of stock options, we should actually have a law that requires that any, uh, any pay over a certain amount for, for um, executive compensation for a public company be in the form of stock Restricted, restricted stock, stock. Right. for a, uh, it's restricted for a long time. Right. Well, I, I think there are a couple of things. Um, I am often, I think, charmingly naive. That's that's probably <laughs> that there is an element there is an element of that in my um, in my writing, I would guess. Uh, but um, oh, naive, especially in the sense of you know the idea that that there are solutions to, to, to problems. Um, but I, but I, I do think that there are cases where um, legislation would make a difference. The, the the problem you run into, obviously, is that. Uh, there are limits, at least in the way corporate law in the United States traditionally worked, to how much 
the state is allowed to interfere with the operations of um, the internal workings of, of corporations. And, um, you know, even in the case of uh, shareholders, there are actually limits the SEC imposes on uh, kind of w what companies are allowed to do. Now, but it is the case, I think, that Congress can, can change these things in ways that um, can be useful. Now, one of the challenges is that there are always consequences that may not be able to be foreseen. I'm not sure that stock options, um, the restricted stock is always better than stock options because restricted stock obviously um, also uh, has the negative effect to some degree of the sort of ticket punching thing that it kind of like allows you to, to reap benefits without anything happening to the stock thing. I mean, but I do think that any uh, regulations that extend the period of time uh, over which performance is measured um, would be tremendously beneficial. And I actually think that whether in the form of shareholder uh, uh, um, efforts or in the form of, of uh, government regulations, that that actually would be a change that could make um, an important difference. Because I do think that the short-term, long-term issue is, I mean, everybody says it, but it's absolutely true. It really is, I think, at the heart of a lot of the big issues um, in corporate America, and specifically the issues on Wall Street. Okay, they, as you can probably guess from the fact they seized the microphones, uh, we're done, so thank you very much. I appreciate it.